Okay, good morning, everybody. So that video covered Saturday's event here called Journey to the Cross. And so the day before Easter, we had uh, 150 people signed up. I think 180 come through, all these families that we set, turned this whole church into stations and scenes that were reenacted of Jesus' life and his death and his resurrection. And so we had all these people come through and we made breakfast. We had Easter egg hunts. There was goats and donkeys and there was just like, this place was amazing. Can you imagine how many volunteers that took? And can you give them a big round of thanks for bringing the gospel of Jesus to our community? That was awesome. It was awesome, awesome, awesome. I want to welcome everybody. See a lot of new faces for our guests. My name is Brian. I'm our lead pastor, and there's this worship guide. We're going to go into God's Word together here in just a little bit. Um, I want to welcome those online, too. We're glad you're with us. Also, all this stuff, uh, all this information is pinned out there on Facebook Live and also on our website. Uh, for our guests, even if you're here just visiting, we love it if you fill out this Connect card and just give us an email address and a name. You can drop it in a box or go out to our Welcome Center, but we would love just to reach out to you and say, man, we were really glad you were here. It was great worshiping with you today, so please do that. And everybody else, you know this little card is really important to us to hear your prayer requests and your needs and your praises. We love to hold those up all week long. But you know also for all of us here back on this back wall, for those of you on camera hanging with me, but just like there's this prayer wall, miracle walls, as we've gone through this sermon series since oh, through the whole season of Lent, there's still room for your prayers of what God's doing, the kingdoms that are colliding in your life, and there's still room for miracles. Today, before you leave, put one up there because all week long we're all over that too. It's amazing, and if you have not read this wall yet, this is the kingdom of collisions and the miracles that are happening in our church. Like, we're even stunned at all these amazing stories and all these hard things going on. But it's a beauty to just sit here and pray and praise over that. So, so please, and those online, you can send us your miracles and your prayer requests. We would love to put them up there also. So we've been in this kingdom collision series for a long time and it's like man brian we're still there we are still there one more week hang with me for a second so kingdom collision has been we've gone through the whole gospel of mark and we've talked about how the kingdom of god that's been brought down by jesus is colliding with the kingdom of the world and at the center is his miracles so we went all the way through mark and we looked at these miracles of jesus that were at the center of these collisions and then the huge collision here on good friday where we where we went through and the story in mark of the cross and then we thought man the, it, for those who follow jesus thought it's over that's the last collision and then we came back on sunday right the tomb's empty the last collision we talked about in the gospel of mark the last eight verses was that kingdom collision when the tomb was empty and jesus had rose and we just cheered it was a great weekend and it's like man i'm so glad we're done that was a lot of kingdom collisions i'm tired and it's like no there's one more and this one's really important for all of us and to find this kingdom collision, you have to go into Mark, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. So would you turn with me uh, to the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6. Turn with your electronic Bibles, your paper Bibles. Uh, those online, catch up with us, Mark 6, verse 1. We're going to jump in there. But before we, we get into this last sermon on kingdom collision, let's pray and let's ask for help as we go into God's word together. Holy Spirit, as we, as we open up this book and as we open up chapter six and as we look at verse one, this would be meaningless to us without you. Only you can illuminate. So give us the heart of first century Jewish people that we can see this through a lens that is so distant but so important to us. And Holy Spirit, we ask you reveal in our hearts and minds anything that needs to change today. And Holy Spirit, prepare everybody here because we're going to ask something really big before we're done. And Holy Spirit, thank you that you're in the middle of every kingdom collision that we go through. So guide us, open God's word to us, and change us. Amen. All right, so let's jump right into the story. Mark 6, verse 1. So as Jesus left that part of the country and returned with his disciples to Nazareth, his hometown. The next Sabbath, he began teaching in the synagogue and many who heard him were amazed. And they asked, well, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? Now look at this. Then they scoffed. Then they scoffed. He's just a carpenter. 
The son of Mary and the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon and his sisters live right here among us. And they were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. And what a shift. So where are we at in the story here? So we're in the middle of Jesus' ministry. We're near the area of Galilee where we've been most of the Gospel of Mark, way up north, around his hometown. Nazareth is in Galilee. And Jesus chooses to go back to his hometown. Now, chapter 6 is late in his ministry before he goes to Jerusalem and to the cross. So what we know from the other Gospels is this is at least Jesus' second visit to his hometown. If you remember, uh, from the other Gospels, his first visit to his hometown, Nazareth, was one of his first public ministry things he did. And he preached in a synagogue, and he riled them up, and they led him outside of town to a cliff. That's how that ended. And then Jesus walked among, you know, right through them. And so now we're into Jesus' ministry, and this time he goes back to Nazareth, his hometown, but he takes the 12 disciples with him. And I think that's really important because this is training ground is what you're going to see. Is I really see this as training ground. So he gets there, and, and he preaches and teaches like he normally does about the kingdom of God that has come with him. Everything has been prophesied, everything. He says he talks about the kingdom of God, and they were amazed. If you go back to the first story when he was there, they were amazed when he preached. Like, where does all this power and authority? And he saw the miracles, and was like, where does all this come from? But then, like hometown people do, for those of you who grew up in small towns, you know how long it takes to start gossiping? It flips. They go from amazed to scoffing, and they're like, well, hold on a second. And they start talking, well, hold on a second. He's just a carpenter. He's Mary's kid. There's a whole thing behind that. I just don't want to go into that. And then he named all his brothers and sisters. If you ever want to know Jesus' stepbrothers or whatever, sisters, however you want to see that, they're all there. It's like they all know this family. And they're like, he's just a carpenter. And they don't believe. And they actually become deeply offended. So this is his second visit there, and it didn't go well. So Jesus responds to this. Let's go back to verse four now. Then Jesus told them, that's the people that are scoffing right now. He says, a prophet is honored everywhere except in his own hometown and among his relatives and his own family. And because of their unbelief, he couldn't do any miracles among them except to place his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And Jesus was amazed at their unbelief. So Jesus takes the 12, he goes back to a place that he had a tough time with, and I think he's showing them. And he's preaching the kingdom of God, he's sharing the good news, and he went to where he grew up with his own family. If you go back to chapter three, his own family was almost disowning him at that part. They thought he was crazy. Like this trip hometown stuff doesn't work a whole really well, right? And so you're like, and imagine Jesus' heartache. These are the people he grew up with, and this is his own family and that's how they react. And there's just unbelief in him. And so here's our first sermon note. If you look here on the back, here's our first sermon note together. Miracles are withheld in unbelief. So what it says here is that because of their unbelief, Jesus, he, he, a few people, there was some belief, and he healed a few sick, but largely he withheld. It isn't because he couldn't, it's because he wouldn't. For you understand that when you do miracles, when you have the power and authority, and you know they're not gonna believe anyway, why do it? And if you look throughout Jesus' history, and now every time he performs a miracle, all you need is a little belief. It didn't take much, and he moved. But this was unbelief. Like, I'm not open to this. And he just says, okay. And so miracles really are withheld in unbelief. And why is this such an important lesson that his disciples are learning it? And what, what's interesting is there's a couple times that it, the scripture shares that Jesus was amazed. It was at belief and unbelief. Can you imagine the God of the universe is amazed <laughs> at belief and unbelief? And what's really interesting, I think this was something that he intentionally brought his disciples there. He intentionally saw that. He intentionally showed them that this is what's going to happen. And he intentionally showed that, hey, you guys know who I am, and even I'm here, and they don't believe. So imagine the challenges that you're going to have. So let's go back into the story. So to me, that's training ground for what happens next. So Mark 6, the second part of verse 6. 
It says, then Jesus, from there in Nazareth, went from village to village teaching the people, and he called his 12 disciples together, huddle up, and began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. And he told them to take nothing, nothing for their journey except a walking stick. No food, no traveler's bag, no money. He allowed them to wear sandals. I think that's funny. <laughs> but not to take a change of clothes. So, so we go to Nazareth for a purpose. He takes the 12 with a purpose. They have an experience for a purpose. And then as they're going to village, village, Jesus says, now it's time. Now I'm gonna send you out. Dynamic duos, two at a time, let's go. And he sends them out. And what does he send them out to do? He sends them out to preach about the same thing he's preaching about. The kingdom of God is here. This is a really good time to repent. It's a really good time to turn from the kingdom of this world to the kingdom of God. It's here, so don't miss it. Right? It's like, don't miss it. I'm sending you guys out to do this. And what Jesus is doing is he says, you are going to go out to preach about the kingdom of God, and the kingdom of God is actually in you. So wherever you go, it is there also. And he's telling them this. You now, 12, are going to be in the middle of the kingdom collision. You are going to be the ones in the middle of it. And so he equips them. So let's go to our second sermon. There's three things in here that we see he equips them with. Jesus first, he sends out the ordinary. He sends out the ordinary. Jesus works through the ordinary and the unexpected. Isn't it funny that when Jesus went to his hometown, what'd they say? Isn't he just a carpenter? Isn't he Mary's kid? Right? They all thought he was ordinary. We know he wasn't, but he chooses to send out the ordinary and the unexpected. We know the 12. These guys are not, they're not educated, far educated. They're not, they're not experts. They get a three-year field trip with him, and he sends them out. So he works through the ordinary, which I hope this is resonating with all of us, of what we can do. Second, he gifts them. He gifts them with power and authority. The kingdom of God that's in them also comes with the power and authority of Christ. I gift you and with this power and authority and privilege to go heal the sick and cast out demons. You are going to do what I do. That's what happens when the kingdom of God shows up. But he says, before you do these two things, your ordinary guys are probably going to reject that. You're not educated. You know, people aren't going to see you as ordinary and unexpected. But you're going to have this power and authority. But for you to use that power and authority, you need one thing in your tool belt. So he equips them with dependence. You can't do this without me. Jesus says, I'm going to give you a walking stick. And, okay, you can wear your sandals. <laughs> But don't take any money. Do not take a suitcase. I want you to know what it's like to be dependent on me. That power and authority you have is dependent on me. You can do nothing apart from me. This is all you need, and I got you. You just need me. And so there we are. We're equipped. He's launching them out. It's go time, but he gives them some more instruction about what happens when they get there. When you get to these villages and the kingdom of God's gonna work through you, here's some more instruction, starting in verse 10. Wherever you go, Jesus said, stay in the same house until you leave town. But if any place refuses to welcome you or listen to you, shake its dust from your feet as you leave to show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. And here we go, it's go time. So the disciples went out. They told everyone they met to repent of their sins and turn to God. And they cast out many demons and they healed many sick people, anointing them with olive oil. Now, this is amazing. So Jesus says, go, go first. This is what we do. This isn't, hey, let's hang here, world come to us. It's go, let's go. So he sends them all out. And so go first, go everywhere. But it's interesting, he says, I want you to hub out of a home. 
And if you look at all the ministry of Jesus and his disciples, they hubbed out of homes and they went to homes. There were times they were in the marketplace and things like that, but the home was the base and the home was where they met people. I think that's really important to understand that. And he says, hub out of this home uh, and don't leave that home. Don't motel six this and keep moving every time you're uncomfortable or whatever. Stay in that space. I got you. And so if you go into these homes and if they reject, if there's unbelief, let's go back to that word again. If there's unbelief, he said, oh, it's okay. As you walk away, just shake the dust off your sandals. Leave them to their fate. Now understand, you're leaving them to the fate of God dealing with them. He's not, you're not banning them. It's like, okay, they're rejecting me, that's cool. The Holy Spirit's not done with them. God's not done with them. Just right now, we're gonna move. We're gonna keep moving. And so the disciples went. They went and took the kingdom of God and they went to these homes where the kingdom of the world was and they were at the middle of the collisions. They healed many people. So miracles, right? They cast out many demons, right? Miracles. They were in the middle of the kingdom collisions wherever they went. If you watch The Chosen, I think it's season three, it shows where they go out and come back. They're all pretty darn excited about what God just, or what Christ just did through them and that power and authority when they went out in the villages. It's kind of a neat scene to watch. But they did, they said, they would go out and they would say, repent. What they said is, hey, we bring the kingdom of God. We want you simply to turn and let's step into this kingdom. That's what they're in, the kingdom of God is here. And to prove the power of that kingdom of God, they healed and they cast out demons. They experienced such great power that had nothing to do with them. And so I think for us, as we look at this, I think for us, there's this really good sermon note that I like. It's sermon note number three. And talking about these collisions, collisions for us, as we go out in the world, collisions start with hospitality and listening. Now I think a lot of times when you use the word evangelical or go out and be an evangelist or go out and share the good news, people freak out because they think about I'm going to stand on a corner and have this sign that says turn or burn and nobody's going to like me. And I think that's what we think. I, I got to stand in here in the midst of some moral, morality issue and scream to the high heavens, this is wrong, this is wrong, everybody's going to hate me and throw stuff at me. And that's what people think. That's not the model we got. The model is go into their homes. So it starts with hospitality. Invite people into your life and invite them to the table. And then listen. Listen to them. Hear their story. Know where they're at in life. Know what the kingdom of the world and kingdom of God is even like. And see if they even know about the kingdom of God. For us, I'm not saying the marketplace is not a place. And God gives you a turn or burn sign, go. But for the most of us, this is relational. The same relationship we have with the Father and the Son is we're designed to have with other people. He says, love God with all you got, your heart, soul, heart, soul, and mind. Love your neighbor. So we start with loving our neighbor. Starts with hospitality. Invite, get invited in the house or invite him into your house. Sit at the table. Sit at the coffee shop. Hear their story. Be dependent on Jesus to know what to say and share with them about the kingdom of God. Introduce them for the first time to a savior who loves them so much they died for him. A lot of people will listen to that story. Now we're kind of done with the gospel of Mark here, That's, but I want to jump into another gospel. I want to jump into the gospel of John because there's something that happened later that was very important for every disciple that went out. And so let's go to the gospel of John 14, verse 12. The words of Jesus. He says, I tell you the truth. He's talking to his disciples. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. And even greater works. Because I'm going to be with the Father. If you love me, obey my commandments. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. So this happened on Pentecost after Jesus went to be with the Father he gave them the greatest gift you ever got and that is the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus says, but if you look at this, what's so important, he says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me, he's talking to his disciples. It starts with belief again. Are you getting the theme here that's repeating all the way from Nazareth to here? If you believe in me, if you believe in this power of the kingdom of God that's in you, you will do amazing things. You will do the same things that I'm doing. And then he says, you will do even greater things. And, and I'm not sure how to understand this context for sure. I want to be cautious in my mind that I can do greater things than Jesus, but I know I'll do greater things than I could ever expect myself. Expect that you'll do greater things than you can ever imagine. And the only way you can do that is through the power of the Holy Spirit. And so there's our fourth sermon note. We can, I'm going to shift to us now, we can do greater things because of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God's very presence in us, which is a gift that comes for those who believe and follow Jesus. And when we have God's very presence in us, we also have the promise of that gift to have guidance, strength, authority, and power. All the power and authority of the kingdom. You are fully equipped. All you need is a walking stick. And you will do greater things than you can ever imagine. But then Jesus says something else. Hey, you won't pop that scripture back up, Brenna? Sorry. I want them to see this. Look at verse 15. It starts with belief in 12. Here's the other motivator. If you love me, you obey my commandments. Two things are really important here, everybody. Two things are really important. Belief that Jesus is who he is and we have that power and authority in us. And two, our motivation to go out and talk to somebody I don't even know is because of how much he loves me. If you love me, you'll, uh, it's very obvious, you'll obey my commandments. And what's his biggest commandment? Go. You look stunned right now. Do you really love me? Then obey my commands, which includes your biggest one. Go. And when we have belief and we are motivated by the love of Christ in us to go and share that, remember what the great commandment is? Love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and what? Love your who? Neighbor. It's our motivator because of how Christ loves us. When we have belief and love like this, we have the power to change hearts, the power to change families, the power to change communities, the power to change the world. But I'm looking in your eyes right now and I'm not sure everybody here believes that. I, I, I can, and, I, and I, I know exactly I think where your heart is. Yeah, Brian, I get this, I get this, but, but can I, can I just go through the common questions I get during the week, uh, in, 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 whether here or whether among, amongst the Christian family, and these are legit questions. First is, well, Brian, yes, I, I know we're empowered and I, and I do love Christ, but you're asking me to go out there. What about our world? Our world is really broken. Do you know how broken our world is? Do you know how messy it is out there? What is going to fix that world? And that's a really good question. Any of you, open your social media feed right now and now you can tell me how broke the world is. What is going to fix the world? I have an answer. But there's another question, Brian. What about our, our, our just everybody's so divided? We've never been as polarized for quite a while. We're so polarized out there, and you want me to go out there and bring the kingdom of God when people are going to hate me? What's going to fix the polarization of this world? Third question that comes up, Brian, what's the answer to all the anger and rage? I, we can't even have a conversation out there. There's so much anger and rage right now, and you're saying, well, yeah, I do love Jesus and stuff, but can, can I do this? Can I really go out and believe and love him and go out in a world that's gonna respond probably in anger and rage? And, and what about my children? I am so worried about our children and what my children are gonna grow up into. And you, I have the same worry every generation before you has had, just to be clear. 
What is going to change so my children will be okay in this world? I'm really worried about my children. I have an answer for what can fix, what, what can take care of the division, what's going to deal with the anger and rage, what's going to make our world a better place for our children. I have an answer. It's you. It's you. It's every one of you in this room, and it is me. This great commission that we've been given as a church is not for a few. It is for every one of us. If you're tired of the broken, divided, and angered world, the answer is you. You have the kingdom of God. All those are the kingdom of the world. You have the kingdom of God in you. The answer is you and me. So much that Jesus gave us a final command when he was appearing for 40 days after he rose from the grave and encouraged his disciples who test drove out in Nazareth, test drove around the, around the Sea of Galilee. Now, 40 days later, Matthew 28, he gives them this, what we call the Great Commission. Jesus says, Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. He earned that through the cross and rising from the grave. I've been given all authority in heaven and earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this. Be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That is the mission statement that every church has. There is not a single church in the world that can neglect this. This is the last command Jesus gave to his disciples is go change the world. And that wasn't given to a few. It was given to everybody who says, I love Christ and I believe in him. It is called the Great Commission. We have a vision statement here. It's just six words. It says, be bold, love loud, engage deeply. It says, be bold in an angry and divided world. Be bold. Love loud because of how you've been loved by Christ. Show how much you love him by going out and showing that love of Christ to others. And engage deeply. That's the last two words. Walk with people. Meet them at the table. Hear their story. Walk with them. If it takes their whole life, love them unconditionally. Share with them about the kingdom of God. That is our, our responsibility, everybody in this room. We have been empowered to bring the kingdom of God to people and collide with the kingdom of the world. We are at the center of everyone. And if you believe in Jesus like this, then you will believe in the miracles that he will work through you. And I said this week one. I said this week one, and I'm gonna correct myself just a little. I said God can move a mountain, but that does not impress me. If God did that tomorrow, it would have really impressed me. But what I meant to say, what I was trying to make the point is God can move a mountain. And that's a big thing. God moves a human heart. That's much harder. And we have that power and authority to move human hearts through the power of the Holy Spirit in us. Change hearts that will step into the kingdom of God out of the kingdom of this world and change their life forever. Every one of us has that power and authority who believe and love Jesus like that. And if you're tired with what's going on in the world, then let's go out and make a difference. Because it hasn't changed in 2,000 years except countless souls have been saved who know the kingdom of God. We have been given the power and authority to go with just a walking stick and shoes and go make disciples, teach them, baptize them, and we're never alone. And we now have God's presence in us that fills us. And every time we go out there, kingdoms are going to collide, and it's like, church, let's go. Let's go collide. Let's go collide. And so here's your last note. Baptism is the great collision. When we go out and collide and we fight with people for their lives and share with them the gospel and the good news of Jesus and, and help them pull out of that world, they express this new belief in baptism. You are seeing a major collision in their life. You are seeing them step completely out of the kingdom of this world into the kingdom of God in the water. That makes it worth it, right? Is that worth it? So I consider and talk about this all the time, but we have five baptisms today to show you what happens when kingdoms collide. 
And so guys, would you help me remove this off here with those who are being baptized? We had three in the first service. We have at least a couple to start here. I'd ask those who are being baptized to come join me. And, and so while they're joining me, let me just share with you what baptism is. Baptism is an outward expression of an inward change. Baptism is a day that I say, you know what, I'm tired of the kingdom of this world and I'm putting both feet into the kingdom of God and I'm staying there. Baptism does not save you. The day you believe in Jesus and follow him and love him, that's what saves you. But baptism is an expression of that. And so why baptism is so beautiful, thank you, Galen. Why baptism is so beautiful is because we go in the water. It's so symbolic. When they go in the water and they get down there in the end and they got water up to here, they are sharing what scripture says. They are sharing the death and resurrection of Jesus. They're sharing in with him in his death and resurrection. When they go down into the water, they are leaving their old self behind. They are dying to their old self. And in the waters of baptism, they are cleansed in the forgiveness of Christ and his blood on a cross. And when they rise up from the water, they are new. They are brand new. They have a new identity. They have a new direction. They have new life. You do not have to wait in baptism for new life one day when you go to heaven. You have new life now because the kingdom of God's in you. And so we know how big this is, right? We know how big. We're watching the kingdoms collide right here in the water. So I want you to hear these stories. These are amazing people today. Beautiful stories. I also want you to pay attention to the person standing next to him because that's the person that chose to go and collide kingdoms for them. But today they're taking the kingdom on and they're colliding on their own and that's why they get in the water. So you ready to go? For those of you here that think, <laughs> I almost can't stop Eddie and he's bigger than me. I'm just gonna block him right here for a second. <laughs> this guy has been on fire. Him and Lindsay, I just can't wait to introduce him to you. But there may be somebody here. I want you to start thinking about this. If, if you've been really wrestling with baptism and today's the day, um, we, will, we, will, we will go with you too. It's go time. And we'll be ready for you here towards the end. Just start processing that if you think this is something that I no longer have any more excuses for not jumping full feet into the kingdom of God. So let's get going. Let's see. I want to need a red mic. And Megan, would you join me up here? So everybody, would you welcome Eddie Bray into the water here? <laughs> so right next to him is, uh, is Megan. So Megan, I'm gonna completely embarrass you. Special friend. <laughs> is that a way to describe? Oh Megan's walking here. Hi, this is Megan. She's my girlfriend. <laughs> and hello, my name's Eddie. I use an old school word, special friend. So Eddie, <laughs> Eddie, tell us why you're here in well, the water today. Good morning, Westview. Uh, I won't lie, I had this big speech written out, but I uh, forgot my phone in the changing room. So it's going <laughs> to come from the heart today. Um, I want to talk to you guys about a big change in my life and how it affected me. Um, so I've been going to church now consistently for the last, I want to say almost two years, but, um, and every time I left, I always felt better, right? Like I always felt like this was the right thing and a big pull towards God. But the biggest change I had, the biggest change in my life that's impacted me, right, was when I started coming to Westview, I started putting God first, right, in my life. I started saying like, this has to be, a priority in my life. It was a big realization I came to. And so over the last four months, I have been reading the Bible and studying the Word of God and um, trying to embody the Word of God. And through my studies, I found out who Jesus was and um, what he's done for us, right? He's made the ultimate sacrifice for us. And I mean, how can you not love the guy? You know, so now I'm in love with Jesus, right? I love <laughs> Jesus. And, uh, you know, and then I asked God and Jesus to really be a part of my life and enter my soul. And, um, you know, that's why I'm up here today. Because I, I, uh, I can't imagine a life now without having Christ and without having Jesus in, in me, in my soul, and in my life. And so that's all I have to say. Thank you. <laughs> Have a seat right there. 
Okay, I'm going to have you grab your elbow here. Mm -hmm. Megan, you can put one hand on it. Yeah, we're going to plug your nose in just a second, but I want to ask you a couple of questions. <laughs> so, Eddie, do you, um, I'll get this question right, do you believe Jesus is the Messiah? I the do. The Son of the living God? <laughs> I do, Brian. And, Eddie, do you promise to follow him, pursue him, chase him, let him be the biggest part of your life from now until one day when you're going to be with him for eternity? I promise. Okay. Eddie, based upon your profession of faith, making can throw an arm in there, here we go. <laughs> based upon your profession of faith, Eddie, it's been a pleasure walking with you, and this is awesome today. So proud of you, but we now baptize you in the name of the Father, his son Jesus who gave everything for you, and the Holy Spirit who will guide you the rest of the way. Woo! <laughs> everybody would you welcome Lindsay into the water <laughs> this is Lindsay Cook and her mom Stacy is joining us here today and we have just got to know Lindsay uh, just recently and it's it's been a short uh, I, I'm just gonna stop all of myself here but it's just been short but it's been amazing I'm excited for Lindsay to share with you today <laughs> Sorry. Um, this day is amazing, and that was so powerful. I'm just, like, so overwhelmed with joy and love right now. So um, <laughs> I've had an amazing life. My family is the best. Um, and I was always raised to know that God is there and loves me and that Jesus is king. And, um, you know, hold on. When you grow up and you go out in the world, um, things get really heavy and uh, it gets hard and you like live through things you never thought would ever happen to you. And you know, I have this whole thing, but I can't, I'm so, <laughs> this is great. But um, I asked God, I was in a cycle, a decade long cycle of abusing substances to be happy and um, to feel nothing and I asked God I begged God I said please rid me of this this desire to not feel anything I'm so tired of not feeling anything and God put in my heart that that is why he gave us his only son and why Jesus Christ died for our sins so that I could die and uh, he could die and be born again and I could too and I am so excited for this day I haven't had the desire to drink or do drugs since that day that I begged God <laughs> and thank you all so much this is just amazing and um Ever since that day, I've been so happy. I can see the world clearly, and I'm so ready to let Christ work through me and spread this in the world. So, thank you. I'm glad you sit right there. You know, I was thinking I was going to wipe away your tears, but we're about ready to wipe away your tears <laughs> in the water. So, Lindsay, two questions for you. Do you believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of the living God? Yes, I do. <laughs> <laughs> and also, Lindsay, do you plan, do you promise this day you're driving a stake in the ground to follow him all the days of your life? I promise. Okay. Go ahead and plug your nose here. Lindsay, based upon your beautiful profession of faith, we now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, Jesus, who loves you, and the Holy Spirit, who will guide you and give you strength the rest of the way.
So if you know the tradition here at Westview Community Church is that um, we also give us, you know, it takes a little while to fill up the tank, it takes a little while to warm it up, but uh, we also want to give anybody an opportunity here today that if you have no other reason to say why, hey, why, uh, I should not be coming down this aisle and jumping in today. I, I want to encourage you, it shouldn't be out of shame, it should not be out of guilt, it should be out of joy, like you cannot keep me out of the water today. But if you're out of excuses, today's the day. We say it's go time, right? It's go time, and we're ready for you. So if you want to go today, we'll, we'll figure out a way to dry you off. We'll give you a, actually a new shirt, a dry T-shirt and everything to go. Um, but we're ready for you today, and I'm happy to wait just a couple of minutes here and see who would want to go today. A couple of things to be cautious with is one is that uh, you don't have to clean yourself up to come into the water. Jesus takes care of that and the church comes alongside. You don't have to be good enough to get in the water. He takes care of that too. You just have to believe enough. Enough that says this is the way and it's go time and let's go. I'd encourage you if you are wrestling with this on your heart, we love to walk with you. It's, there's never a pressure tactic in this. When everybody's ready to get in the water, they're ready to get in the water. You can see that. Church, if, if you really believe in the Great Commission and you really love seeing be baptized, he works through you and he changes lives through you. You have that power and authority and we can be loading this thing with water every week if our whole church is on fire. And we can keep claiming more and more ground for the kingdom of God every week. And that's the kind of church we want to be. Last chance. The water's warm, really. It's probably from all the sin and stuff that's in there. And I, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm just messing with you. So I, th I think this is a really good time to look at offering. And as we go into offering... Uh, uh, is your hearts full? Amen? Amen? And so offering is how we respond with full hearts. After a day like today, water everywhere, this is what it's all about. But we respond in offering today. So I'm going to spend just a couple minutes in offering when I want you to reflect on a couple of things. And so would you bow your heads with me and pray? Heavenly Father, first thing our offering here today is the five souls that have got into this water today and put both feet in the kingdom of God and said there is no turning back especially bless Lindsay and especially bless Eddie today as they got in the water. I also bless the three people this morning, uh, Dennis, and we pray for uh, Cody, and we pray for Danny who got in the water this morning. Father, we are the church. We are to come around them. We are to guide them and help them on this journey. Walking in baptism is actually walking through a door that starts a journey. Father, for those here who are wrestling right now with, with baptism, it's going to be the biggest day of their life. So Holy Spirit, work on their hearts and let the community of faith work around them. Encourage them to come forward. Encourage them to come forward and just begin to talk about this. But now, Holy Spirit, I'm gonna ask for everybody in this room and everybody that's with us online to reflect on two things for just a minute. The first is, if I'm not sharing and going out and sharing the kingdom of God with people, what am I missing in my belief or my love for Jesus? If I really have not shared with anybody in months, what is wrong with my belief and what is wrong with my love? And Holy Spirit, just point that out and point how I can change that. So Holy Spirit, take a minute and talk to every heart in this room and every heart online. Now, Holy Spirit, we're going to ask one more thing in offering, and that is, who is that person <laughs> that you want me to bring the kingdom of God to their life? Who is my one? Everybody in this room should have at least one person in their life that they are sharing the kingdom of God with. And so, Holy Spirit, put upon our hearts now, whether it's a family member, a schoolmate, a friend, whoever, our neighbor, who we don't even know yet, Put on our heart who that person is who needs to know Jesus today.
now, Holy Spirit, it's go time for our church. Rise us up. Let our offering today, our financial gifts, as we leave today, we drop them in the box or we give online, whatever way we do that, because we're fueling mission around the world. This church you are doing huge things with, so we commit our financial to that because we love throwing in with the body of Christ to our time this week, our resources this week, my mower I'm gonna lend to my neighbor so I can talk to him about Jesus, all those things this week, that is our offering. Your offering was your son on the cross. Our offering is giving our lives back to you. Father, we are your church. Jesus, thank you so much. We can't wait to talk about you. And Holy Spirit, give us that power and authority and strength. Let's go out and collide.